Hi folks. Welcome to part six of our lectures on the nervous system. And in this video, we're going to talk about the spinal cord structure and function, and then a little bit about the peripheral nervous system with a focus on the somatic peripheral nervous system. So the spinal cord is an extension of the brain stem. So it's part of the central nervous system and it runs through a set of openings in the vertebra of our spine called the vertebral canal. You can see that uh, in the two images on this slide and you can also see all the way on the right the cord is in yellow and then the spinal nerves are shown in gray. The vertebra in white and the intervertebral discs in red. The spinal cord carries information up to the brain that comes in from sensory neurons and it also carries information down from the brain about motor activity. It is a center for spinal reflexes and a spinal reflex is an automatic behavior that does not require, it's called a spinal reflex, does not require the brain in order to occur. When we look at the anatomy of the spinal cord, um, the first thing you notice is that the gray and white matter are flipped with respect to the, how they're organized in the brain. So the gray matter is on the inner part of the cord. And the white matter is on the outer edge. The gray matter area is described as uh, looking like an H or a butterfly. Um, you also can see in this section through the cord, the central canal, which is an extension of the ventricles of the brain and is full of cerebrospinal fluid um, and can just make out some of the different layers of the meninges. The pia is the um, one that's easiest to see here because it's just looks like the outline of the cord. Notice that there is an asymmetry in the gray matter. The upper part of the H or the upper butterfly wings, um, which is um, the dorsal side of the cord, so the back side of the cord, uh, is smaller. And there's a functional reason for that. The ventral side is where the cell bodies of motor neurons are located. The dorsal horn is what accepts incoming sensory information and is composed of terms of the neurons is composed of interneurons that relay the sensory information. In the slice of the cord on the left here, you can, this is a different stain, you can much more clearly see the difference between the gray and the white matter. You can also see, because they've left them attached in this section, the exiting ventral nerve rootlet and the entering dorsal root. So these are coming in and these are exiting. And those, the axons, so the cell bodies of the motor neurons are in the ventral horn, they're sending their axons out. So that's information flow out. This is information flow in. That information is handed off to an interneuron. The interneurons are going to send information directly to the motor neurons, and that's what will form a somatic reflex pathway that we'll be talking about in a second. 
Um, and there also are interneurons that will accept information. I'm just going to uh, have a branching axon here out into part the white matter. And that information is going to be sent up to the brain until that information let's say about pain gets up to the brain, you don't actually experience pain. The structures, uh, the um, oval-like structures are called the dorsal root ganglia. Ganglia is the plural, ganglion is the singular, and the dorsal root ganglia are where the cell bodies of those sensory neurons are located. So the receptors are someplace out in the body and they send the axon, their axon in through the dorsal horn. In these two images, the gray matter of the cord is drawn differently. Um, and that's because we're looking at two slightly different areas of the spinal cord. The actual shape of the H or the butterfly, however you want to uh, describe it, is different depending on whether you're in the cervical, thoracic, lumbar, sacral um, cord. This is a really important pattern of innervation to have, uh, to get in, to your memory uh, because it forms the basis for reflexes. I just added a little green interneuron there in the gray matter. All right, so the cord is part of the central nervous system. The dorsal root ganglia and the nerves are part of the peripheral nervous system, right? So the barrier that defines the central nervous system essentially is the, the pia mater, um, which is what the layer of the meninges that's directly associated with the cord. So the peripheral nervous system has nerves, which are groups of axons that travel together through the body and ganglia, which are the collections of cell bodies that are outside the central nervous system. The cranial nerves extend from the brain and the brain stem. There are 12 pairs of those. And the spinal nerves arise from, you guessed it, the spinal cord. And there are 31 of them. Um, they're associated um, in lockstep with the different levels of vertebra. So in the somatic peripheral nervous system, we have sensory nerves that are carrying information in from the body to the brain about pain, pressure, temperature, position of the joints, um, force of gravity. And those are coming, that information's coming in cell bodies in the dorsal root ganglia the information goes into the central nervous system segment by segment, which is what the different colors in this image represent, the different uh, levels of innervation of the spinal nerves. And then mo the motor nerves are carrying information from the central nervous system out to the muscles, in this case, skeletal muscles. One interesting thing about this figure um, is that if somebody has um, areas of weakness or numbness, the physician, the clinician, neurologist, whoever's examining them is going to look at that pattern of weakness or numbness as a way of trying to assess where the problem is in the nervous system. So peripheral nervous system Think back to that concept map about um, all of the, the organization of the nervous system as a whole. We're just now looking at the peripheral nervous system. We have the somatic 
nervous system, which serves skin, muscle, tendons, and skeletal muscle. Um, and then we have the autonomic nervous system, which serves glands, organs, cardiac, smooth muscle, and two divisions there, the sympathetic division, which is the run from the bear, fight or flight division, and the parasympathetic division, which is the what sort of brings you, after you've escaped the bear, which brings your body systems back to um, a reasonable level. So, as I said before, in the somatic nerve, nervous system, the spinal nerves are bringing in sensory information into, first into the spinal cord, which is central nervous system. That information is going to travel on the same level of the cord to motor neurons, but also is going to travel up through a set of uh, neuron, re you think of it as a relay, the signals being passed from one neuron to the next until eventually you actually perceive it. Now for us, this feels like it happens in real time, but you can actually demonstrate that um, each of these different relays, the handoff um, involves an additional amount of time. The system serves mainly voluntary movement, um, but some of our actions are automatic and those are referred to as reflexes. They occur rapidly without conscious thought. Um, and this, when you think about this, right, sometimes people will say, well, you talk about skeletal muscle as being voluntary. And that's true, but it also doesn't mean that those muscles can't be co-opted and used for reflexes. So again, I want you guys to remember the pattern of connection that you see in this slide, because it's, it's essentially the the neural pattern for spinal reflexes that involves skeletal muscle. So you have sensory information coming in. There's the cell body of the sensory neuron. That information comes in through the dorsal root and is handed off to an interneuron. One of the things um, to just sort of put in your memory bank is that often right? what we do is draw the soma, not the dendrites because there's so many of them and that would make the diagram really awkward. And then an axon and the little upside down V is representing synapses and connection, uh, passing of information to the next cell in the pathway. So we have dorsal root, right, the dorsal horn and the dorsal root, the dorsal root ganglion are all sensory in nature. Then we have interneurons passing that sensory information directly to spinal motor neurons and also going out into tracts of white matter that are going to send information uh, imagine that the axon would turn and come straight up out of the page or out of the screen toward the brain. Right, then we've got a motor neuron. Its axon is going to go out through the ventral root and the dorsal and ventral roots join up to become spinal nerve. So when we talk about spinal reflex arcs, right, we've got essentially the pattern that I, I just explained to you guys. Um, if we think about a pain reflex, right, so in this case we have um, somebody sticking their finger into a candle, which is the stimulus for, the, for this particular reflex arc because it's about pain. Um, the perception of let me back up, not the perception, the um, reception of pain information 
which is carried through the axon or the well not exactly an axon but it's carried um, through these strange long dendrites in the case of sensory neurons you get the dorsal root ganglia and the cell body here that information is sent into the cord which is number three number four we've got passage of the information by an interneuron to number five the motor neuron which comes out and becomes part of the spinal nerve activates the muscle that's number six and then number seven is the response which is to move the arm out of harm's way All right, so very briefly, we're going to talk about the autonomic nervous system. Um, as I said, when you hear autonomic, think automatic. Regulates the activity of involuntary muscle, which remember includes cardiac heart muscle and smooth muscle, which is all of the muscle associated with internal organs other than the heart. And it's divided into these two branches that act in opposite ways. So the sympathetic and parasympathetic divisions of the autonomic nervous system contact the same organs, but their effects are opposite. So we have the fight or flight division, which is sympathetic. And, you know, I think if you if you the easiest way to remember what happens in the sympathetic division and sort of what happens in a um, fight or flight or immediate stress response is to think of a time when you've been really scared by something right so your heart rate increases your breathing rate increases um, it turns out your metabolism increases as well. But there are other functions that slow down. After that fear response is over, the parasympathetic division of the autonomic nervous system acts on those same organs to bring them back to baseline. So you can see in this image we've got the Parasympathetic, this, let's start with sympathetic. So this, think sympathetic stress. Your pupils dilate. Your mouth gets dry because the smooth muscle in your salivary glands um, is less active. Your heart rate increases. The air, your airways dilate because the smooth muscle associated with them relaxes, digestion slows. But what the way that you maintain adequate blood glucose levels is, remember our friend glycogen from biochemistry? Glycogen is the animal storage carbohydrate produced in the liver and also in skeletal muscle. So the sympathetic nervous system can stimulate the activity of enzymes that break glycogen down into glucose. So you have lots of glucose in your, the bloodstream. You have secretion of adrenaline and noradrenaline. Um, your bladder is inhibited. parasympathetic nervous system again it contacts the same organs but in the opposite direction so your pupils which had been really dilated constrict and come back to normal salivation heart rate slows your airways become a little narrower um, your digestive tract is serviced by um, blood vessels more fully. Your gallbladder contracts. Um, if you've had a fatty 
particularly fatty meal, and bile is secreted, which is necessary for fat absorption, and your bladder can contract. So word to the wise, um, when you get to anatin phys and you have to learn these two systems in more detail, focus on learning one or the other, right? Because if they act in opposition, right? If one leads to dilation of the pupil, the other one is going to constrict the pupil. Um, the This is referred to as the sympathetic chain, which is another set of, of ganglia. And the parasympathetic, para means around, not quite around like peri does, but similar. And you can see, if you just look at the way the anatomy is set up, that the parasympathetic division brackets anatomically the sympathetic all right, so this last slide is just to sort of pull all of our understanding of the nervous system together, right? We've got the central nervous system in green, brain and spinal cord. We have the afferent pathway shown in with red arrows. So we've got somatic sensory nerves, visceral sensory nerves. Vis the word viscera means organs. So think um, sensations from your, from your internal organs, from your guts. Um, that information is carried in through either the somatic or autonomic nervous system, the sensory aspects of it. Um, so it's carried into the spinal cord. The spinal cord sends that information to the brain. And that's still considered part of the afferent pathway, right? So if I have um, somatosensory information coming in from skin, let's say, right, it's going to come into the cord, be handed off to an interneuron, which is going to send the information up probably to a neuron in the brain stem and the reticular activating formation. The next neuron is going to send it into perhaps the thalamus, well definitely the thalamus, um, perhaps the pons which will send it to the cerebellum. From the thalamus that information is going to go to primary somatosensory cortex the front of the parietal lobe and from there it's going to go to an association area in the parietal lobe. One of the amazing things about the nervous system is that all of the different sensory information that our system gathers comes in through separate channels and the brain is responsible for putting that together into a coherent picture of the world. And that's where, you know, you can sort of think back to the video on, on phantom limb pain. Um, you might even think about watching that again now that you've had this introduction to the nervous system um, and see how much more you get out of the video. The efferent pathway, the exiting pathway, um, if it, we're talking about voluntary activity, would start with the frontal in the frontal lobe um, with it's not called secondary motor cortex but with the area of the frontal lobe that initiates movement that's going to get sent to primary motor cortex which is going to send it down through a set of relays to the spinal cord where that information is going to be passed to a set of motor neurons. It's going to go out through spinal nerves to skeletal muscles to produce voluntary action. The other half of the efferent or motor pathway involves the autonomic nervous system and again involuntary muscle which is smooth and cardiac um, and 
two branches, the sympathetic, fight or flight, run from the bear branch, and the parasympathetic or rest and digest branch. All right, that's your introduction to the nervous system.